great conversations underway, so sorry to intrude on those. I want to say a little bit more about storytelling and using this archive that we've started to build uh, as a way of storytelling and doing what archives really are good at. Um, I think we'll have, we're on the schedule, uh, if you've looked at it, we're the schedule for right now is, well, actually an hour ago, was uh, copyright and accessibility and other issues. So we're going to address those things uh, right after lunch. That'll be the first thing. So we're just kind of sliding uh, things back a little bit. And I think we'll also be doing some wrap-up stuff. I think Ellen will be doing wrap-up stuff uh, after lunch. But then I think we'll also have some time for troubleshooting and particular questions that you've come across on your screen. So I'll be around to help with that uh, as much as I can, or make a list of things to research or figure out so that we can continue to be in touch. So I'm hoping there'll be a mailing list so that we can use that to ask questions and answer questions about how to build this uh, infrastructure. So questions that you've got, um, I probably won't address before lunch, but let's do that after lunch. So um, I want to say a little bit more about storytelling. I brought up I in the, 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 in the slide. Uh, I don't have it here. In the um, registration packet folder of the, that you link to to get stuff, I put a document in there called links, uh, which is the links of stuff I'm about to talk about right now um, to show off a little bit about default Omeka functionality, since we've seen a lot of the back end, but not so much of the front end. Um, so the, I think it's called the registration packet folder. Oh, oh. Uh, online, and there should be a file in there called links. Uh, and that's this, if you want to reference any of these sites. These are kind of at random, to illustrate things that I think are worth illustrating. We have talked a lot about collecting and archiving. Um, that's obviously very important. But I don't think any of us are necessarily doing the collecting and archiving uh, just for its own sake. We want to use the material. We want other people to see it, uh, to use it for research. We want to tell stories about it. We talked a lot about metadata uh, the other day, well, actually, the last couple days. The difficulty of Library of Congress headings, the problems with categorizing stuff that doesn't seem to fit into existing categories. You've all heard that if a tree falls in the forest and no one's there, does it make any sound? If your if your item doesn't have good metadata, so you can see the analogy, right? But you all have stuff, right? You all have images in your mind. You have photographs. You have cultural heritage. How many of you thought about the metadata of it before now? I'm always concerned about that. Yeah. Because if I write a archaeological. Which is not <laughs> not good, right? <laughs> you want to protect the, the stuff, yeah. Uh, so there's 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 specific reasons for thinking about metadata. Other there's some other hands of how many of you thought about metadata of the things that you're uploading into the archive. You 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 almost have to now because so many things require metadata, right? We're all building sort of digital tools and platforms in one way or the other. So we we can't get away from it. On the other hand, you never think about it. Right? All of these things that are important, right? Family photos, right? Artifacts, whatever the digital form might be, they were they are important because you got the metadata right. You never thought about it. Right? Why are they important? Where does the meaning come from? And it comes from the stories you tell about them, right? The shared heritage. So I want to focus a little bit now, after we've got away from the back end, to think about sort of what do these stories look like? Um, the way stuff gets discovered, the way people are going to find out about the heritage that you want to share and preserve isn't going to be primarily through the cataloging data. It's not primarily through the metadata. That's important, but it, the way they're going to find out about it is how it's embedded in stories, right? how the stories are linked to each other. Search engines are really good at pulling stuff out of stories. They're less good at knowing what metadata is. 
because it's a little bit hidden. Marty's going to talk more about that, what it means for entering metadata and so on, free text and description, so I'll let her talk more about that. But I want us to think about the stories and the importance of having stories to make the collection visible beyond just how you enter the item data in a metadata. So part of the fun of digital archives is that people can take it in totally different, unexpected directions. It's also a little scary because you lose control of how stuff is getting used, but it's a double-edged sword. Uh, I, we can't really talk about what people will say about items we put in our collection, but we can talk about how it can be said and how that can create a new vitality or a vitality to the project. People have asked me about sustainability and why should I put stuff in the New Mexico Digital Heritage Archive? Why don't I just create my own? The idea is that there's a lot of different projects across the state, a lot of different people, community projects, institutions, organizations of different kinds, different sizes. If we're all sort of working with the same database and the same software, we're all kind of pooling our resources, there's a level of sort of stability and sustainability to that that individual projects aren't going to have, right? in addition to the fact that we can see each other's items and put them together in really interesting ways. So the medium is part of the message, right? When we're talking about how people use items in your collection, it's not just that they can see them, it's that they have to see them in a particular way. It's the story, it's the presentation that really resonates. Over the last decade, many collection projects have embraced a recombinant or database histories approach, which is that the idea that if we just put a lot of items in something like Omeka, right, or tools like Omeka that preceded it, databases, if we put stuff in and we catalog it accurately, people will find it, they'll use it, and it'll have this whole new life, right? It sounds really great, but we've really proven over and over again, digital humanities projects, for the last 10 years at least that I've been working in the field, that this doesn't work, right? If you build it, people don't necessarily come. Right? You have to have a way of sort of getting those stories uh, out there. A lot of the standard Omeka sites, I'm going to click on the first one here. Often at the bottom of the page, you can see proudly powered by Omeka. This is a standard Omeka installation. I'm not here to sort of crit criticize this. I'm going to critique it. Uh, but I'm not here to sort of put it down in a way. But when you see this, you know, the hair on the back of your neck doesn't exactly stand up, right? It's, I wouldn't call it inspired. Uh, but it's the standard archival functionality, right? And this is, look at the title, Core LGBT Archive, right? That's what it's meant to do. Standard Omeka functionality that the stuff you've already, you saw it a little bit on our homepage, that you, that you get featured items, featured collections, featured exhibits. This is exactly like the Georgetown slavery site we looked at before, right? I mean, the aesthetics are different. Same categories, right? Font size is different, the colors are different. Recently added items over here, which takes you to the item view. This is, this is what Omeka gives you just by default. You can make exhibits, right? This is where you get into more interesting kinds of presentations of the items, besides just browsing items. This is this is the exhibit, right? <laughs> no, there's actually a link you have to click on, right? Interface matters. Some items here, right? This is a very minimal exhibit, right? It's just some items and captions here. You can click on an item and you go back to the item view. Right? It's very straightforward. And again, I don't mean to be critical, but it's very boring. Right? It's just a digital archive. Right? There's no interface, there's no story, there's no empathy, really. It's just the collection. And it is fabulous that this collection is available and visible to us. Right? But that's the accomplishment here. It's not about, it's not really about cultural heritage per se, it's about having a digital archive. So I want us to talk about, well, we have very little time before lunch, but sort of start the conversation today and as we all disperse after the workshop, to think about how we want to tell stories. Let's go back to another one. These are all Omeka sites, right? You can see a site. You will have Omeka radar 
when you leave here, or when you go to lunch, right? You will see the site and you will think, hey, that looks like an Emeka site. This one happens to be powered by Emeka as the platform, the version of the platform we're using, right? Similar kind of homepage is a big uh, graphic collections, right? You get into the collections view. This one has a bunch of item sets. I mentioned that you can, when you upload items, you can assign it to a set. It could be the name of your project. It could be, you can have many item sets within a particular site or project. So as you click through these, it's basically the same thing. This item set has two things, right? Two people as part of the staff, standard item view. This one has embedded, embedded audio as well. Right. The point here is that it's a digital archive, right? That's what it does. Collections, interviews, resources, that's it. Another one quickly. Fancier homepage, right? We've got the embedded video description here, search bar, front and center, brief introductory text, and then the same kinds of tabs we've seen before, right? Events, people, places, organizations, and so on. In all of these sites, we could click through uh, more. Uh, it's not going to tell us anything different. Hey, what, what kind of site do you think this is? Proudly powered by Omeka, right? Looks the same. Oral histories, exhibits, stories, archives. So you see stories and exhibits being much more foregrounded here on the tabs. The imagery, right? It's not just a digital catalog like the other ones were. So clearly a strong effort here to bring people into the stories, right? With the imagery uh, and with the tabs and so on. Exhibits, right? A much richer set of, of exhibits, some based on people. Uh, most of these are people with some places and other things. Stories, right? So again, clicking through the basic Omeka functionality of how do you tell stories using your archive. I showed you before very quickly how you can almost drag and drop images into your into pages that you make yourself, put text around it, uh, and so on. Right. So this is a the, 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 this is a different website altogether, right? So there's a link in that Omeka site that takes us to something completely separate. So we can use site. Which is something we can also do within, within the Benitos or the in a digital heritage site, like link to outside things. Okay. In all these, these cases, there's a couple more links, I, there's no need to go through them, you get the idea, right? In all of these sites, right, I think the one, right, in all of these sites, there's ways of browsing, right? You're just browsing stuff that's in the archive. And there's always a search bar, right? Think about how much the idea of a search bar constrains the way we think about digital archives, right? We always think we should be browsing or searching. That is beaten into us, right? Every day we use the web. You browse or search for something. You go to a library catalog, that's what you do, right? That's not the only way you communicate about stuff. Right, browsing and searching. It's a very, it's actually a very old technology, right? It's on all these digital sites, right? The reason we have sort of, you know, the metadata is so important isn't because of digital technology, it's because we, when we didn't have digital technology, we had to categorize everything or no one could find it, right? We still use that technology now, even though searching algorithms don't care about metadata nearly as much as, as uh, we use. So the search, uh, that be able to browse, be able to find everything, right? The interface, all of these interfaces tell you that wherever you click, you have found something interesting, right? You're always looking at items, you're always browsing through them. Search tells you that there's all just a bar, right? You don't, you don't even have to use it. Just the fact that the bar is there tells you there's this whole world of stuff waiting for you to discover, right? But where? The challenge we're grappling with is how do you collect as much stuff as possible, right? But not just create a browsable and searchable interface for it, but how do you get it to people? How do you make them care about it? One of the things that's great about database histories, as they're called, is that they refuse a single history, right? The antiquated way of doing history, a very positivistic way where we're just accumulating knowledge about the world and getting smarter about it, rather than thinking about it in a more relativistic way. Different people have very different views about the same past, right? About the same doc historical documentation. 
problems, always open to continual revision and reinterpretation. That's what we want to foreground in the resources we build, right, through our digital storytelling. Here's, I'm trying to get into your head in the five minutes I have left, um, that, that uploading items, cataloging them, categorizing them, it's very important, right? You already know that, but it's just one way of accessing information, right? And we shouldn't get so focused on being everyone being able to find things through those limited interfaces, right? Um, Arthur Danto, a number of you probably are familiar with him, analytical philosopher, wrote about what he called the ideal chronicler uh, in 1965. It's his book, Nishi as a philosopher. Uh, this chronicler is the ultimate in history writing. Uh, he's like constantly absorbing all news from all sources, from multiple perspectives, and writing a perfect history of it from all angles in real time. Right? It's a perfect combination of like journalism and, and his historical writing. It's completely fabricated, obviously, the ideal chronicler. No, you could never do this, right? But this is this is the kind of view that grows out in 1965. What's happening in mid-60s in terms of digital technologies? All the all this stuff in front of your face, right? All computer, right? This is where we really start to see the power of computers and databases and digitally connecting information, right? This ideal chronicler is somebody, he's not talking about digital technologies, not to uh, but it's coming out of this worldview that we can have all the information collected and at our fingertips. It's going to make us so much smarter about the world. Right? It's going to be more objective, right? All of this stuff is going to be here. The randomization, the recombination is in. So we have tools like Omeka, which give us this possibility of sort of infinitely combining everything. And so we get obsessed with the idea of adding more items and figuring out what the metadata should be because it's saved, it's categorized, and therefore, in this technical utopian fantasy we want to live in, everything's automatically connected and visible. But in reality, nothing works that way, right? No matter how well you describe your item in the item page in Omeka, it's invisible until it has a life in some other way, in some other story, in some other page, or links in other sites, right? If the connectedness that we need. So there's a tension here between wanting to connect and collect as much as we can, archive it, put it on this digital platform, pool our resources, right? But we also have to forget. We have to decide what stories we're going to tell, what, are, what items in the collection we're going to use, which ones we're not going to use. We can't do everything at once, right? So just collecting it, it's an important sort of long-term goal, right? But in terms of making this heritage vibrant and accessible, right? We're just we're focusing on such a small bit. So I think it's very easy for us, especially if we spend all morning back and back in thinking about sites and projects and permissions, to get focused on this very discrete technical challenges of how do you build a collection, right? That is just a tiny little step of this huge journey ahead of us to make these things more visible. So what I want to, I'm not really going to talk about it, I'm just going to say what I want you to give me later, which is ideas of how you want to tell stories. You've all seen websites or digital essays where you thought, hey, that's really cool. Whether it was a typographical feature or whether it was just a kind of layout or sort of how did that page and how did that way of telling a story resonate with you? The default Omeka view, as I've been explaining, is not great, right? So we can't just focus on the archival process and stop there, right? We need ways of and mechanisms of functionality for telling stories. These are also Omeka sites uh, that you can see the work gone into the creating the interface. So they have a slide viewer uh, up front, and as you scroll down, they have sort of a timeline. They have different ways of, of getting you information, right? There's a map section, which is interactive here. You can turn up layers on and off. Uh, they have a more sort of visual display, right? This is kind of the long scrolling page that's in fashion now, right? So same kind of site, right? It's an archival site. That's fundamentally really what it, what it does, but it's got a much sort of a, more of a storytelling interface, right? Here's another one. This doesn't look like an Omeka site. Well, it's not. It's just uh, a lot of you, it's a novelist, some of you maybe read this. 
Uh, I like this because you, there's going to be a lot of videos, there's oral histories, there's a lot of stuff that you're capturing or will capture over time. How do you talk, how do you, how do you present them? You can just upload it to Omeka and have an item page, right? Don't do that, that's boring. So here's a way of making it much more exciting. And it's really not that, there's nothing complicated about it. In a way, that's kind of why it's good. It's just an essay with video clips, and they're all a couple of minutes of uh, the interviewee talking. Uh, and then below it is a transcription of what he says with all the ums and repeats taken out. Right? So you get a very succinct transcription, but it doesn't look like a transcription. It's not just a file you can download. There's no big button that says download transcription. It's just the essay with him saying these things embedded through it, right? All the video has been, this is one long interview that's cut up into these one to two minute segments, right? So a really simple solution to a complicated problem is you have this video that has a lot of great stuff in it. Which is gonna be more accessible to search engines? A page that has all the content written out or just a video embedded on YouTube? <laughs> the first one, yes. Uh, you want the text written out. This is what search engines find. This is how we're going to connect all of our resources, all of our heritage together. It's through text, right? It's through the stories. That's enough of that. Yeah, I'm going through fast because we have these links if you want to explore more of it. This gets sophistic slightly more sophisticated, right? This kind of interface, not an Omeka site. Not surprising, right? But very simple. Nice images, nice typography. It's a little small at this uh, level, lots of links to other stuff, bold, images embedded. This is stuff that you can, we can just easily do in Omeka already. You can change the font size, you can embed images. But I want us to think about how we're going to create things uh, and tell stories, right? And, and learn from each other and experiment, right? Find models like this, and it doesn't have to be this one, obviously, that you read and think, oh, this is, I want to read more, right? Uh, pull quotes like this one, uh, just to you know, make it more visible, right? This is the kind of stuff that I hope we can create through the archive, right? Never mind the images, but imagine your images here and your stories here, right? Very simple, right? That's why it's compelling. It's very simple, and it focuses you on the content, right? These are super beautiful. Look at that. Here's another one. If you ever want to know how JPEGs work, this is the greatest article you can ever read. And it has this awesome thing, this is totally not relevant to the workshop, where you can go see a JPEG image and you can see the code that makes it. This is a bunch of numbers, right? It's data. And you can edit it. So you can see how the code of a JPEG, that, what you can see. I've wasted a lot of time on this thing. It gives you a challenge. Can you figure out what the numbers do? And yeah, you can if you spend enough time. Uh, that doesn't matter. Look, it's clear, right? There's more from the parametric press, right? Obviously advertising. But imagine more from New Mexico Digital Heritage, right? With this kind of sidebar formatting. So the main article uh, is clear, right? Nice caption, simple images. This is something that uh, Omeka doesn't really give you very easily out of the box, but something that uh, we can add. Uh, is sort of the sidebar text, right? So you can have different kinds of conversations in your stories, right? These are all s simple, but that's that's the point, right? They're compelling in the way they combine images and text in, in an unobtrusive way. They don't look like the standard Omeka site. One more, one more site and then one tool. Uh, a table of contents that just stays on the screen as you scroll through it so you know where you are, right? Very obvious typography, right? To catch, to move your eye in a very deliberate way, right? There's nothing, forget about the animations and stuff, which are their own uh, deal, but just the idea of organizing a page this way with images and text is something you can already do in Omeka, right? You have to take the time to do it, but this is where we think about sort of the power of storytelling. And again, these are just random examples that I've seen recently that I thought were, had cool components to them. Uh, you'll have your own inspirations, but I want us to be sharing those and, and collecting those and thinking about, hey, can I do this in Omeka? Can I make my page look like this one? And tell me, ask me, send me an email and say, I want my page to look like this. How do I do it in Omeka? And I'll get it to happen. I like writing code, so it's, it's, it's easy. Universal viewer, this is a tool to display images, right? The standard Omeka image viewer is, uh, is fine. It just displays the image in a page. It doesn't really give you a way of moving in or out or looking at a more complicated image. 
here's a tool. This is not part of Omeka, but we can use this. It's not part of any platform. It's just a tool that we can use in our sites, our pages. Right? Let me scroll down. I'm in Story of Medicine, so of course I'm going to click on the uh, medical history one. Here's an example of the viewer being used at the Welcome Library. You have uh, images or sets of images where you want people to be able to zoom in or out and sort of look through uh, a catalog of images. Right? This is kind of a, it's, you can make the viewer look however you want. This is, I think, kind of an ugly one, but you see the functionality here. You can zoom in, you can drag around. So when you have photographs or other things, architectural drawings, whatever you have, where you can only really see so much on the screen at once, but it's got really rich detail that you want to show, this is a great way of doing it. Again, something that I want you to find in the wild and say to me, can you add this? We want to have this. We need this. Right? I'll we'll put it there. We want that. We need this. <laughs> <laughs> Noted. Uh, I thought you might say that. It's on the links page, sorry. Right. Um, how do we provide a context for interpretation? Right? So this is a tool, but Going back to these other, uh, oh, they're all up here, right? Uh, going back to uh, these other sites, right? How do we provide context for interpretation, right? Through just how we design our pages, how we provide uh, links to them. There's other sort of features that you'll have seen in various websites. You have basic slideshows, right? Um, which uh, is so easy to do, right? But this is something we have to decide to make available to ourselves. Uh, to make these, to, to tell our stories. Um, you've seen other sort of timelines or other maps. Those are all kinds of things that we can, we can add to the Omeka platform to allow you to make richer web pages. Um, but we have to do it deliberately. So my, oh look, I have one minute. That's all I need. Um, what I want you to think about sort of throughout the workshop, and especially after you leave, is sort of what do we want our stories to look like, right? Now, let's not stop at just getting stuff in the database. Obviously, that's a crucial first step, and it goes on forever, literally, until the sun swells the earth, and it doesn't matter. But we're going to continue to add more stuff to the archive, but at the same time, we need to be thinking about how are we, how are we foregrounding it, right? And that's through simple pages that tell really compelling stories. The stories are amazing, right? We don't have to sell the stories themselves, but we do have to make them look a certain way, or people aren't going to care. You've all gone to websites, maybe today, where it looked like it was old. It might have been made yesterday, but it looked old, looked out of date, and you didn't care. Right? And that's what you get with the standard of method functionality. Right? It's very cookie cutter because they expect us to figure out what do we want to make, how can we make it going forward? What what do we need? What tools do we need? What technologies do we need? What kind of typographical conventions do we need? The nice thing about having different sites is that even though we're pooling all of the the resources in one database, for reasons that I covered earlier, we can all have different sites. You can have your site look different, right, than everyone else's, right, with whatever, but all drawn from the same resources, right? So you get to foreground in your site and your aesthetic what's important to you, right? But we all draw from this common share of resources, not just photographs and images and items, but also code, right? The same functionality that uh, can appear on one site, appear on all the sites if you want. Right, so there's this constant reuse. And so when you imagine all the different cultural heritage institutions that are trying to tell stories with their collections, if we're all using the same kind of tool, right? We're all, every time anyone makes any progress to tell their stories, everyone benefits. There's tremendous power. I went a minute over, sorry. Have a great lunch. We'll come back, I think, at 1.15. Yeah, and I, I, just one more thing to think about uh, over lunch and, and towards the end of the day is the power of the university community partnership. So it's not like everybody has to become necessarily a, a, a web designer unless they feel like it, because we have access to um, students uh, who are looking for projects and um, faculty members and, and people in the library who can help us out and so help us brainstorm and solve our problems. If you are, you know, in the position to be a good partner, and one of the super exciting things that's happening, I think, is this idea of having a digital humanities program, because you and is really hard to partner with. Because, like, who do I call? Right? It's a big place, and if we have this sort of coordinating entity where we can uh, get interns for you or have class projects work on 
um, you know, issues, that that is a really powerful thing that we have going for us. And we have not only UNM students, we have Northern students, we have Highland students. Just depends on what it is that you want to do. And you saw examples from Shane about like, yeah, I can take blueprints and historic photographs and I can recreate a building that was in your community that doesn't exist anymore. You know, that's the kind of thing we want to see happening. Um, you know, in, in our in our project. So um, let's, you know, go strengthening that, that infrastructure that way so that we have really good, strong connection between people with the stories and people who can help us with the storytelling. Um, I think it has just amazing potential. I really thank you for, for helping to put that together on the UNM side. It's been really exciting. Okay, we'll see everyone yeah. back at 115.